Hello and welcome back to the Friday Casebook. Roger Casale, the founder of the Civil Rights Organization Europeans and I, we have been off the air for quite a while. There was a big summer break, but now we're back. And Roger, I want to know what has happened during the last weeks, what still sticks in mind when you think um, of uh, yeah, the summer and the latest events. A lot's gone on, hasn't it, Lena? It's great to see you. Uh, from the trivial to the really uh, catastrophic. Um, just to start with the, the trivial, I, I spent some time uh, in Rome over the summer and uh, what people are talking about in Rome this summer, it seems to me, certainly the conversations I've been in, is all about mineral water. You know how in our houses we used to have a hot cap, tap and a cold tap and then somebody invented the mixer tap. Well, the Romans, see, they've got this uh, going now for mineral water. You, you, you will have been drinking lots of water over the summer and you're always offered still or sparkling, but you'll be pleased to know there is a third way when it comes to mineral water, which is called leggermenti, uh, lightly sparkling. And um, I'm not going to name any products because otherwise we'll get into trouble with the advertising authorities. But this seems to have been something that was very important to, 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 to Rome. I don't know if people have been talking about mineral water in Germany. Have they over the summer at all? But you, you may not have been in Germany over the summer. Yeah, that's great. No, I've not heard of this at all. <laughs> and it's true, I've not been in Germany so much <laughs> in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> what, yeah. what people seem to be talking about in Germany, if a Die Zeit was anything to go by, they had a feature about this over the summer, was whether people should get married or not. The Die Zeit, which is a fantastic and very serious German paper, had a, a long feature uh, about uh, reasons why people should get married and reasons why they shouldn't get married over the summer. Oh, tell me. <laughs> great interest. And there were six reasons why people should get married and there were three reasons why people shouldn't get married. I can't remember what they were, but what I do remember is that on the list of six reasons why people shouldn't get married, I couldn't find the reason because we're in love. That that didn't feature at all. It was all about <laughs> it was all about if you get married, you're going to live longer. Okay. Apparently, the statistics show that people who are married uh, tend to have a longer life expectancy. But then I thought that's probably some kind of bias in there, isn't there? Because I mean, probably <laughs> if people are healthier specimens in the first place, they're going to <laughs> have a greater probability of finding a lifelong partner. I don't know. Anyway, this seemed to be something that was absorbing uh, the readers of Die Zeit over the summer, reasons to marry, reasons not to marry. But on a more serious note, I mean, obviously things over the summer, we've had uh, terrible things happening. I mean, uh, volcanoes exploding in, in, uh, in, in, on Spanish islands. And, uh, but obviously the, 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 the big story over the summer was the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and what that means for the transatlantic relationship. That gave a bit of a shock to the Europeans and especially to the French. And that was close followed up by the cancellation of the French government's submarine contact contract with Australia and a lot of people think this is the end of the transatlantic relationship I don't think it is the end of the transatlantic relationship it's just but it's still a very bumpy ride people thought when Donald Trump was placed by Joe Biden that things would suddenly get better um, I think things have got better the mood music has changed but I think the reality uh, is still quite a tough one um, and of course, uh, France is now uh, trying to get some uh, ships sold to, 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 to Greece to make up for the loss of its submarine contract with uh, Australia. Perhaps we need to come back to these sorts of issues on the Friday casebook, issues about European sovereignty, European defence, transatlantic relationship. But I just want to draw our viewers' attention, if I may, Lena, to two articles on our website. One is by a fantastic uh, writer called Anatole Levin, who is a professor professor and a great expert in relation to Afghanistan about the situation in Afghanistan. Of course, he makes the point, he reminds us that uh, there have been several attempts to create a state in Afghanistan over the last 100 years. Every attempt has failed. Uh, the British tried, the Russians tried, the, the, the Americans have tried, they've all failed. Now the Taliban are going to try and his expectation is that they're not going to be able to make a state either. And one of the reasons they're not going to make it, be able to make a state is because of the uh, problem with Al-Qaeda, 
and with Islamic State and so on, and the uh, fric factions within the Taliban itself. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know whether one can talk about moderate uh, Taliban uh, uh, Taliban uh, people, but I mean, the big challenge for, for the Taliban is going to be dealing with Islamic State and, and, and infiltration by Al-Qaeda. So I think I, I do have a look at that, that a very interesting article on our, our website. And I think the other article about Afghanistan on our website is written by a coalition of organizations in Europe that represent migrants and refugees. So speaking with the voice of migrants and refugees, refugees and really saying to the European press do not scaremonger about the refugee issue from Afghanistan and sharing their experience with other uh, situations with migration and refugees that we faced in Europe over the last 10 years. I'm not going to call it a crisis because as you know we don't believe there's a migration crisis in Europe. A lot of people are on the move around the world. Europe needs to do its fair share but I do draw our listeners attention to this very uh, helpful statement by migrant and refugee organizations themselves in relation to the refugees that are coming to Europe now from Afghanistan. So I, I just make those two those two points. Well, what else do you say still sticks in your mind from the summer? Well, most recently, of course, we've had the German elections. Congratulations to Olaf Scholz and uh, add our, our congratulations to those of Angela Merkel, the end of the Angela Merkel era. Not quite, because, of course, she still stays on for a while as Chancellor. What struck me, uh, Lena, was uh, everyone got excited about the results on Sunday night. Uh, and, you know, I, I, perhaps from other elections, France or Italy or the UK, you know, people tend to sort of sit up all night waiting for the results to come in. And there's sort of great excitement through the night. Whereas it seemed to me that, you know, at about 10 o'clock, Olaf Schultz sort of seemed to say, well, looks as if we've won, uh, I'm off home. And off he went, he left the studio, <laughs> he got on the bus or whatever it is he used to go home. And it was all very civilised and all very uh, quiet and calm. And one might be forgiven for thinking that nothing was really changing. But of course, it is a significant change. Angela Merkel has been there for a long time. We need to see what's going to happen here. But do you have the feeling, Lena, that this is a really a, a, an important, a big change? change in Germany or is it really more more of the same but just with a different face? First of all it's not yet decided what um, what the political landscape look like so I think we need to wait a couple of more days hopefully not weeks to to know what's going to happen in Germany but also of course in Europe. That, that is the key point, isn't it, that you make, that it takes a long time to form a government after an election in Germany. So perhaps in some other parts of the world, you have the election and by the next morning, if you do set up or sit up all night, you, there's been a change of government within 24 hours as a result of the election. It's not quite like that in Germany. This is just the uh, end of the beginning of the election, of the uh, following the, the counting of the votes. Now the negotiations begin around the... the uh, the coalition, which can take a very long time. I remember in Belgium, had the same thing. I think it took over a year once in Belgium. So obviously people can't stay awake for a year. They, they <laughs> and it's not surprising that all of the Charles said, I'll see you later and set off uh, on his way home at 10 o'clock on election night, because still got, you know, per weeks, but possibly a couple of months ahead of him before we know exactly what the shape and the color of the German government will be. Yeah. But I hope this won't be the case in Germany because I feel like this would destabilize um, the political landscape in Europe in general. But I do feel like um, it seems like a fragmented landscape at the moment. It's a fragmented picture everywhere, I think. But th th that can also be a harbinger of uh, change. And of course, we've got two other big elections coming up next year. Uh, we've got the uh, Orban uh, election and the Macron election. Some people might see Macron and Orban as uh, sort of the two goalposts, if you like, of the political space in, in Europe, uh, either ends of the spectrum. And uh, I noticed that Orban was having a summit in Budapest at the moment, not, not a democratic summit. You wouldn't expect uh, somebody like Orban to be terribly interested in the theory of democracy. A demographic summit, because of course what Orban wants to do is get Hungarian women producing more children. That's part of his political program. And to stop migrants from, which of course, in my view and Europeans view, would be an excellent, uh, an excellent result, a uh, way of uh, uh, rising to the challenge, a demographic challenge of an, uh, uh, an aging population. We'd simply have more migrants coming in, as has happened in Germany, for example, under Angela Merkel. He doesn't want to do that. He wants uh, Hungarian women to uh, spend their time uh, making more babies. So he's had his democratic 
demographic graph, demographic summit. I don't know what they've been talking about there. Presumably birth control and things like that. Uh, pretty horrifying stuff. And he is um, also in touch with this so-called rising star TV star in uh, in France, who apparently is going to. Uh, going to be standing in the elections uh, next year, uh, Zamenhof, and um, who's looking as if he could get 11% if he, sta if he stands. And he, of course, he will have been helped by the news this morning that Nicolas Sarkozy, former centre-right uh, president of France, has um, been given one year of house arrest. And uh, uh, for his uh, what he was doing in terms of campaign uh, funding and 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 not and, and overspending in the election campaign, but I, I think that anybody who splits the far right is probably uh, quite good news. We're not a political organisation. We don't uh, endorse a particular political party in New Europeans. But we don't like leaders like Viktor Orban and we know that he doesn't like organisations like us because Europe has got to be a space where the rule of law is respected, where we respect human rights and where we encourage democracy. And we don't think that Viktor Orban, whatever the colour of his political party, does that uh, or cares about that. So thank you very much for this uh, first Friday case book in, yeah, after summer break, I'd say. <laughs> and talk to you soon, Roger. Talk to you soon, Nina. Thanks a lot. Thanks for all our viewers.